we welcome you back to the steam room. Uh, your special guest today. You are absolutely right, Chuckster. And as we tell all of the special guests uh, into the steam room, please uh, keep your towel on. Andrew Yang. Uh, wow, this is this is really cool to have you on here. You you ran for president on the Democratic side. We saw you in the uh, we saw you in the debates and. Um, just look forward to having you share your perspective on where we are in the world. And you're an NBA fan. You can talk about where we are in the NBA too. So thanks a lot for joining us, man. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me guys. Big fan of both of you. I can't tell you how many times I have seen you all on TNT dissecting a game I just watched. <laughs> and, hey. and, it, and it still resembles the game you watched. That's the good thing. <laughs> Go ahead, hey, so, Andrew, so listen, what was your, it takes guts and courage to say, I'm going to run for president of the United States. And first of all, you probably have to talk to your wife before you make a decision like that. How was that first conversation with your wife? My wife didn't take it that seriously the first time, Charles. Uh, and I, I've been a serial entrepreneur for a number of years. So she heard, uh, I was like, hey, baby, I think I'm uh, uh, running for president. And she was like, uh, okay, let's talk about that again. <laughs> was that, that, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, she was a rock and a rock star uh, throughout. And certainly, when I decided to run, I was not a household name. And so uh, neither she nor I really knew what that run would look like. Um, so I'm really grateful that she uh, supported her husband's somewhat crazy vision from day one that became less crazy as time went on. Hey, what do you think it's going to look like in November, <clears throat> uh, Andrew? Because there's so much talk about mail-in ballots. There's, uh, you know, there's so much. It's almost like the president is already planting this seed that if uh, that if he doesn't win, it's because it's rigged and all this. But I mean, when do you think? How long after election day do you think we're going to know who the president is? It depends upon the vote margins in different places, Ernie. Uh, so if you have a wide enough vote margin where you can be confident that it went to a certain candidate, regardless of whether the mail-in vote has been fully counted, uh, yeah. then you could get that state in pretty quickly. For example, I'm pretty confident that you're going to know uh, New York's results pretty quickly or something like that, you know, <laughs> like, a, like a very clean blue or red yeah. state. They'll be like, yeah, we can call that one. Uh, the, the tough part is the swing states, and the concern is that we're going to be waiting for days or weeks if you don't have a clear margin in Michigan, Florida, Ohio, and some other places. Uh, and, and that is the danger behind trying to cast doubt on the uh, mechanisms of our democracy, because we could be waiting a while. And time has a, a, an unfortunate effect where we all get together November 3rd and watch the results. And then if you don't get results, then like the, the days start trickling in. And then it's harder to maintain the same level of energy if literally it's days or weeks later when you say, and this person won. I mean, we're all old enough to remember the uh, Bush-Gore race. Back, hanging back chads. In, yeah, the hanging chads and the Florida recount. And then like eventually Gore was like, look, I'm just going to concede for the good of the country. Uh, even though we could have kept contesting. So that's the nightmare scenario that we all hope does not unfold this fall. But if you look at the margin and the nature of the, the battleground states, unfortunately, it's quite possible, even likely, that we don't get a clear result the night of. Let's talk about the NBA for a second. Your, your tweet yesterday was short and to the point. You said, good for the Bucks uh, as they sat that game out and then all three games were postponed uh apparently the word now is that the season will resume we just don't know exactly what the, how that schedule is going to play out but uh, andrew in, in your mind what can nba players do like in the wake of what we saw in kenosha what would be what would be the best plan for nba players um to get their message across and to create change well, first, it's heartbreaking for all of us to see what, that this is still happening, and it's been happening for years and decades. You can even imagine uh, what happened to Jacob Blake in the absence of a video, 
you know, there'd be some story about some struggle and then like no one would know, but because of the video, we all know. Uh, so the first thing is you need to hold the actual officers in these cases accountable. Uh, the officer that killed Breonna Taylor, the officer that shot Jacob Blake. Uh, you can't have a society where some people are able to feel like they're somehow above the law. And that includes police officers who end up uh, killing or paralyzing or, or uh, brutalizing American citizens. So that's number one. And so the, the fact that the Bucks are saying, look to, to the legislators in Wisconsin, like you need to convene, pass some of these laws and hold people accountable, I think is the direct first step. Uh, but Ernie, when I looked at the, the bigger picture, um, this is a massive problem ongoing. And, and I think the, the struggle for NBA players is that you're concerned about police brutality, which is a massive problem. Um, and then there is racism, which is a whole other set of problems. Uh, and if you focus on the, the, the police brutality, there are a number of policies that would change things. And it's a real fight to get those policies adopted. But that, to me, is where the attention should be, the energy should be. So what are these policies? What, what does it mean? Number one, you have to try and change the rules of engagement for police officers. You have to say no chokeholds. Uh, you have to de-escalate use of force. You have to warn before you use a firearm. You have to have these non-lethal measures before you shoot to kill. Uh, you have to have a standard where officers, if they see another officer doing something excessive, then it is their responsibility to intervene. These, these are rules that would help uh, reduce this violence. And so that's one thing they should be fighting for, in my view. Uh, the second thing is union rules. And so this is where it starts getting nitty gritty, is that well, police officers have a lot of protections baked in. Um, and including a standard that makes it very difficult to punish. It's one reason why when you see what's happening with these officers, it seems like it takes forever for anyone to be held accountable. Uh, and one reason for that is that there are union rules in place that make it very difficult um, for, uh, for police officers to be held accountable. Uh, and that's exacerbated by the fact that if you're a local district attorney, the last thing you want to do is mess with the local police. Uh, force that like they're literally your best friends most of the time they're making the cases for you uh, and so if for you to turn around and say well this police officer uh, needs to be held accountable it's very very difficult um, so the union rules is number two that the third thing which plays into the local versus federal is like you need more federal oversight uh, you need someone you can call when this sort of thing goes down because there are 18,000 police departments around the country uh, and so you're, you're talking about 18,000 different cultures, 18,000 different police chiefs, eight, you know, 18,000 different. And, and so it, if you're trying to get into the guts of this problem, the, the, there needs to be some kind of uh, national body that says, look, this is a massive, tragic, brutalizing problem, and we need to do something about it. So these are some of the things that that I would be pushing. One thing that I think the NBA players are really passionate about is you need more non-police intervention where a lot of the times when you're getting these phone calls, it's for something that you don't need a police, an armed police officer for. It's like someone who's struggling with addiction uh, or like a mental health problem. And if you send a police officer there with a gun and the person doesn't obey orders, then something terrible can happen. Something like a third of the victims of police shootings are mentally ill. So if you had more people that were trained to deal with mentally ill uh, folks that didn't come armed or you sent them with police officers, that would be an enormous Benefit, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this stuff, Ernie. No, without question, this stuff. Uh, it, it, and it, and it we, serious. Andrew, we need to be. I mean, that's that. We have to be passionate about this. And I think um, when I look, I've never been to a police training facility. I don't know what a, what a, a kid goes through when he decides I want to do this and I'm going to go through the academy. But but to me, it was, and as we talked about it the other night, I said that that use of deadly force has got to be a last resort and not a best option. You know, that it, it's, it's, it, and that's why when we keep seeing these and we, and we just keep on shaking our heads and say, when's it going to end? Uh, it has to, there just has to be, going back to your point, something in the training that says, look, we don't want to do this, guys. So listen, you, you said you were 44. 45. 45. Yeah, 45. And they tell me you're a Knicks fan. So, I, I was. <laughs> oh. no, listen, I, I'm just trying to say, as long as you've been alive, they have sucked. So how are you a Knicks fan? 
You know, Charles, I remember your playing career very well. I remember your MVP season in 93 uh, with the Suns. Um, and so I remember the Knicks led by Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley and those guys, uh, John Starks, Anthony Mason, uh, that entire crew, they were competitive throughout my entire teenage, uh, you know, experience. You know, did they win a title? No. Like, you know, did they lose to Michael every year? Yes. <laughs> but we were good, competitive, hard-nosed, a great team to root for. Uh, and that was your heyday, too. I, I remember vividly, um, you know, your sun season with KJ and Dan Marley and yeah. those guys. Uh, and, and So then, are you going to are you going to stick with your Knicks? Or are you going to be a front runner and run over to Brooklyn? Uh, so I ended up kind of breaking up with the Knicks uh, when they <laughs> I mean, it was just one bridge too far. But when they dumped Jeremy <laughs> Lin, it was just too much. And I was like, I oh, just girl. <laughs> Um, and it was over money of all things. Are you kidding me? This is the franchise that overpaid Jerome James by like 30 million for like, you know, like one good game or whatever. And they like couldn't pay Jeremy Lin, like essentially like our adopted hometown hero. It made me so angry and sad. I was like, I just give up. Um, and so then I, I tried to become, then I was a basketball nomad uh, or vagabond for a little while, which was pr frankly very difficult. Uh, and then I slowly started becoming a Nets fan because of Kenny Atkinson and Sean Marks. They're like a good, scrappy, young, competitive team. So it wasn't the front runner thing, Charles. It wasn't like, ooh, KD and Kyrie are here. Let me get on board. Um, it was the fact that they had a good culture. They were competitive, scrappy. They were developing people. Essentially, they were the opposite of the Knicks, who haven't developed a good <laughs> player in 20 years. Well, uh, they, developed Por they, they developed Porzingis. <laughs> yeah, they developed him right and, out of there. And Dallas and Porzingis. Yeah. And, and then they traded him for like a bag of chips. That was that was a good time too. <laughs> well, I tell you, when you started steering this conversation in the Knicks direction, that was right in the wheelhouse, Chuckster. Uh, uh, Andrew Yang, thank you so much. We uh, we consider you a loyal steamer now, and you can consider us uh, honorary members of the the Yang Gang. And uh, and we appreciate so much your perspective and and the time that you gave us today. Um, and thanks for for not you know lording that ivy league education over these two sec guys we appreciate uh, the fact that you dumbed it down for us you you guys have been voices of both reason and joy for me uh, over the last number of years and decades i'm super uh, grateful to you all I i'm a big fan of you both and uh, you know you uplift a lot of people um, this time, but any time, really. So, uh, you know, don't sell yourselves short. Uh, I've been a big fan of, of your work for a long time. And when I got this request, uh, I was like, no way, me on the NBA on TNT, which this is not quite that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I, no, no, this is better. This is better. <laughs> hey, and listen, we can go around bragging that we had a presidential candidate on there, too. That's going to be big yeah. on our resume. And a sure future thing, man, president. I'm I bet a future presidential candidate, too. You're going to run again, aren't you? Uh, well, Ernie, as long as the problems are there and I can do something about it, I'm going to oh, do so, it. Hey, that's a hard yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My kids and, aren't getting any more rugged, that's for sure, Charles. I better do something. <laughs> and, and I know this is one of your themes, so you'll like this shirt, too. Yes. There you Be go. a better human, indeed. We need yes, so much indeed. more of that, Ernie. Like, hey. and, and I, you know, and I appreciate how hard it is right now because it's just a very difficult time for everyone. You know, this well, is uh, a. Thank those you my, very much, Andrew. Yeah, those are my buddies at Combat Flip Flops who put those out, and it's it's really become my uniform for this podcast because, man, we got to keep on trying to we got to keep on trying to improve and do better. So. Uh, we appreciate uh, the input you had today, man. You had some wonderful ideas, and so thank you much. Thank you both. Appreciate the heck out of you. Stay safe. Yes, Will sir. Do. You too. Welcome back to the Steam Room. Special uh, guest. Thank you so much. It's like you're you're the uh, the alarm system. Anytime a special guest walks down the hallway and toward the Steam Room, and please keep your towel on, Chris Weber. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely keep my towel on. Oh, that's a nice one, man. It's got a nice Sacramento Kings logo on there. That's you know, looks like an old Washington logo. There's a Michigan. Oh, that, man, that's that's impressive. That's impressive. But please keep it on. Keep uh, it. So, uh, C. Webb, thanks for being here. Uh, we had uh, spent part of uh, Wednesday night with you on our pregame show. You were uh, spectacular 
in uh, voicing your your thoughts on what we had seen that day in the NBA, which was unprecedented. Uh, we're understanding now that games will continue. As we speak right now, we don't know exactly when. Um, but just put it all into perspective for us in, uh, in terms of, from the bubble down there of what the players have done um, and what they can do moving forward. Yeah, EJ, I mean, there was a lot of emotion into it yesterday. I'm thankful to, to be with a company like Turner that allows us to have these conversations because we can say what we feel, but you can't criticize anyone for their opinion. You know, I can't say you're not right or, or you must kneel for the flag or all that. Everybody has the right to do um, what they believe is right. And so I was inspired by the fact that through this – impulse, even though it may not have been communicated the correct way and other things that the result was a pause and starting a conversation. And um, I, I, think, I think that, you know, you can't have change right away, but I think some of the conversations that they started are going to reverberate through neighborhoods, through families, and I think and I hope that there's a plan of action to follow through after. See, Webb, when you're, uh, again, and this is something I think that we, we talked about a little bit on the air yesterday, but I mean, there's, there has to be a degree of helplessness uh, in the bubble. Uh, look, uh, this, is, this is conditions aside. I mean, I, right. you know, I, look, I know room service, I know golf, I know, I mean, that you have these amenities down there, but, uh, when you can't go um, uh, and you're watching things happen like Kenosha, um, can you speak to the frustration level of that feeling of here we are and we can't do anything in person about it or, you know, be there to be, to talk to people in Kenosha or anything like that? Yeah, EJ, and talking to some players, they really – it felt like they were letting people down. They felt as if there are people out there protesting and doing things and to really show their power is to show we're man of the people and we're out here with you. So I think a lot of that frustration was they felt like we're here watching TV, we're here playing sports and life is going on outside and we want to be part of that. And I think that that that's the problem that the bubble created. If you could play a game in LA, play a home game, and then go protest and get right back to practice the next day, it probably would be um, a better feeling. And, and that helplessness that you talked about, that's exactly what they've expressed to me. The fact that, listen, I can't do anything. I'm in a room, I can't even call. I can't, you know, what do I do? What do I do? And I think that anxiousness built up and they said, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do. We're in the bubble, but we're gonna stop it for a second to make the world see that we want to be active, if anything. How, how weird is it just calling the games? I mean, just the spectacle of the games down there with no fans. I know you got the virtual stuff going on, but is it, what do you feel like you're watching when you're calling a game, see? You know, I feel like, I feel like it's like the summer leagues. Uh, it's way more competitive than that, but that's the feel on the floor. Where we sit, we're, we're up and, you know, we're encased in glass and then below us, are, you know, maybe where GMs and owners sit, and there's only maybe 20 people there, and they sit kind of in rows of twos, and they don't clap or, you know, <laughs> they don't get boisterous. You, you know what I mean? The energy comes from the benches. That's what I like watching the benches. It's, um, it's, it's really weird, but I'll tell you what, though. After the beginning of the games, because of the great job by production, I forget everything because those boards look really real. They're about 20 feet tall. So you realize they aren't fans, but then again, sometimes you really can't tell on both ends. And so it, it's been weird, but you get lost in the middle of the competition uh, as soon as it gets good. Well, I, I just got to give you guys credit. It, it looks – the players have played their behinds off, uh, which from, I, I really want to take my hat off to the players because from day one the game started, They've been competitive. They've been good games. Uh, I love what Portland did. I love what Memphis did. I love what the Phoenix Suns did. And now in the playoffs, man, with all the stuff going on, 
whoever wins the championship this year, I've heard some people talk about it being an asterisk. I'm like, hey, there's no asterisk on this. What these young men have been through, man, it's, it's, it's one of the greatest things I've seen in my life. Uh, I, I, like I say, I was pessimistic that it could work. We still got a long way to go, but to get this far, I got to take my hat off to Adam and the players. Uh, you know, they've just been amazing. Yeah, Chuck, I mean, you know from a competition standpoint, I'm, so we know you're a great player, but nobody really knows how you used to bust somebody's ass in practice, right? And you know how in practice you can have just as good of a practice as a game except you're really loud and can't nobody check me and, and, yeah. and it's that much. That's what's been going on here too. Yeah. The, the fact that there's no distraction and no crowd and guys are talking like, no, you can't hide from nobody now. You got to check me or uh, the fact that guys, uh, I think what you just said, Chuck, because I'm not going to lie, I didn't put an asterisk, but I said before the playoffs that everybody was saying if LeBron wins, this is the hardest playoff. And I said, I don't know, because it's no travel. That's the hardest on your body when you're older. Uh, it's no meeting, there's no media, everything's easier. But I agree with you. With everything that is going on, it's not even an asterisk. It's almost a plus sign. Like, it was a little harder that year uh, yeah. to, to do it. I, 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 I totally agree. Hey, Chuck, let me ask you this. I, I know this might hurt. But what's your boys in Philly going to do? You know, I, I've said this before. It's time for Joel Embiid and Ben Summers to grow up and become grown men. You can't, Joel L.B., Joel L.B. has got to get in shape. And Ben Simmons got to work on his game. You know, Brett Browns is a good guy, but he didn't, he didn't demand enough out of his two superstars. Well, they're not superstars. They're all-stars. You know, we should not be all these years in and Ben Simmons won't shoot. Right. That's the, like, you should get better as a player from year to year. And we should not be worried about if Joel Embiid is going to be in condition. You know, they gave both of them guys $150 million. Listen, if I give anybody $150 million, I should be able to tell them what to do. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, and, and listen, that's the thing that's scary, c Web. Because I live in Philly during the summer, and I'm asking about it every day. And they said, I said, listen, the least a guy can do if I give him $150 million is to work on his jump shot. The least a guy can do if I give him $150 million is get in shape. That's not a lot to ask. No. Oh, uh, let me ask you this, T. Well, what the hell happened with Nate McMillan? Chuck, so we did the game, and all I kept thinking was, this is what I thought after the game, man. I can't wait till Nate McMillan gets a healthy roster. Oladipo wasn't that healthy. They don't have yeah. Sabonis, Sabo, I mean, an all-star. And I'm thinking, like, man, because and the team played hard. Warren, he allowed him to grow, and they played defense. They played hard. They just, there's no way they could beat Miami, period. And so after the game, all I was saying is, man, they're going to have a good summer. They're going to be tough next year, you know. I don't know what happened. And But a coach um, that we interviewed said this to me. They said, um, maybe in the exit meeting, you know, someone said, well, hey, we think you could do like do this. And he said, well, well, if you think you could do a better job. So, I don't know, but somebody I know else. he did not deserve to get fired. I, I know that. I know he can. He's one of the best coaches in this league to me, and um, I don't understand that move. Yeah, but I was I very, was, I was very disappointed in that one, and I was disappointed in the uh, Alvin Gentry firing too, because you should give you should give a coach a chance with a healthy team. Like Zion, the, the jury's still out on him, unfortunately, about his health, but. You know, New Orleans to me, that that's a good job if Zion can stay healthy. That's the one thing. The three jobs that that that's open are great jobs. Yeah, no in doubt. My opinion. Yeah. I mean, Indiana. Listen, when they get that boy Sabonis back and Oladipo get a year on his leg, Philly, there are three great openings in the NBA right now, and I, I can't wait to see what they're gonna do. We welcome you back inside the steam room. Uh, if you uh, are a loyal steamer, you know how we always uh, wind it up. If this is your first time in the steam room, um, we certainly hope you've paced yourself. Haven't stayed in here too long. Don't want anything bad to happen to you. Uh, but we always finish with uh, the old school Chuck's answering machine. Roll it. 
You've reached Charles Barkley. Leave a message, America. Hello, Mr. Barkley and Mr. Johnson. This is Brad from Stillwater, Minnesota. I was just calling to say thank you. I've appreciated your guys' podcast and the uh, the topics you've discussed, bringing awareness to mental health issues and the guests you've had on to open up and talk about their struggles. I myself struggle with PTSD, um, and it's reassuring to hear from other people that it's not – it's a uh, – problem a lot of people face and it's with these trying times now I feel it's a more universal problem and I wish more people understood that and I just wanted to again say thank you and it's been good to hear it's helped me a lot. Thank you and take care. Wow. Wow. Man. That call, that Ooh. call means. Man. That, that call man. means the world. It really does. And man, it's. Y'all got um, the, you got the tux, tux to tearing up. You know, Ernie. Uh, wow. Um, man, Brad, uh, wow, thank you. Bless you. Uh, uh, thank you for your service, too. And I just want to say, man, you made me feel so much better today with that call. I mean, because I'm not going to lie, my life has sucked the last few days because, man, this is stressful because I got – I'm juggling two balls in my life right now. I got being a black man, being a TV guy, we both need each other, but we got something way, way more important going on. And I'm torn at times like, should we be playing basketball? Should we not? I says, then I'm like, yeah, you're gonna have a great platform. And then something like what happened in Kenosha happened. And then you, you see how the players are at because that's the toughest thing about being a black celebrity. Man, you have to answer all these questions. I, I, I said, when you're a black celebrity, you get asked every black problem that goes on. So this thing has been really stressful. Uh, but Brad, man, you made me feel so much better. And I'm so glad that me and Ernie can make things better for you. When we we got this silly little podcast that's been awesome to do. And I want to thank, we've had some amazing guests. I have people walking up to me on the streets just talking about, yo, man, I really enjoyed uh, J.J. Watt, Nick Saban, Sanjay Gupta, you know, Andre Iguodala. I mean, some of the guests we've had, uh, it's been amazing. You have no idea how many people you can impact by just telling your story and that it, you know, it kind of makes the day of a guy like Brad who then has the stones to get on that answering machine and as, as emotional as he was, make that call. And, yeah. and knowing that, you know what, they might actually put this out here and that may actually get on that podcast yeah. and millions of people may hear it. Yeah. It may hear me breaking down it, as, as it, I'm on it, this. But you know what? That was the power of that phone call from yeah. Brad was that he had to struggle to make it through it. And and you know what? That's another step. That's another step yeah. in just reclaiming your life. So, man, Brad, yeah, you, yeah, you, you fire up me and me and the Chuckster together. Yeah. You, you, you know, Ernie, he fired – remember when the lady called us who had lost her job? Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, th 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 this reminds me, this is obviously a little bit different and more uh, serious, but she, well, that's always serious about losing your job. But the lady who had lost her job during the pandemic who says, you know, I started walking every day and I started listening to you guys on the podcast. And I just want to thank y'all for making me feel great for an hour, hour doing the podcast. I was like, man, that's, what, that's why we do this podcast. So You're exactly right. Uh, so so Brad man, you made me feel great today. 
Like I've like I said, I've been, <laughs> you know, Ernie. I, I tell people I've said I don't know five hundred thousand times in the last twenty four hours. Everybody's like, you think they're gonna play again? I don't know. When they gonna play? When is the scene? If they play, when you gonna start? They gonna play again? I don't know. So I, I'm sick of saying I don't know. But man, thank you for that call, Brad. That was awesome. <laughs>